Hi. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll get started. Renee is here too. So, first of all, um, thank you so much for to all of you for being here today. My name is Krupa Parikh. I'm the Associate Director of InPrint, and uh, we're excited to be presenting Renee Rotson for the InPrint Tool Brain Series. Thank you. Um, we hope all of you enjoyed the little craft activity. Um, was that fun for those of you who did it? Yes, yes, okay, good. <laughs> did it make you curious about Renee's new book, Ways to Make, Ways to Build Dreams? Did it? I see some nods, okay, good. Um, speaking of ways to build dreams, uh, when you arrived today, you received a free signed copy, or many of you did, um, of the new book. We give them out at the Infant Full Brain Series events to the first 100 families. It's a gift from us to you. Enjoy it. Um, Brazos Bookstore uh, is in the lobby, and they're selling other of Renee's books. So please stop by their table. Um, they are our amazing partners in this Imprint Cruel Brain series. They are one of Houston's leading independent booksellers, and we love them. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to begin by uh, telling you that um, just going over a few things. When you came in today, in addition to the book, you also, some of you received a number. Uh, that is for the book signing. We will be calling you up in groups of two, uh, tens. Um, just be sensitive to the numbers that we call up and only come when we call up your number. Um, some of you also picked up a survey. We love your feedback on this series because this series is for you. So give us your feedback. Turn in the survey to one of us at Imprint on your way out. We really appreciate it. Um, the Imprint Curl Brain series is one of the few reading series specifically designed for middle grade kids um, and the authors who write books for middle grade kids. Um, <clears throat> Imprint has been conducting this series for more than 15 years, guys. 15 years. Some of you are not, uh, are not even 15. Um, if you miss some of the past readings, you can watch them on our website, imprint.org. Go to the big For Readers tab at the top, and then go to the uh, Imprint Archive of Readings. We've had Jerry Kraft in the series, Kate B. Camillo, Alan Gratz, Aaron Entrada Kelly, Jacqueline Woodson, Jason Reynolds, even RJ Palacio. So check out those videos. Um, there are many people we want to thank uh, who make this series possible. We owe a big thanks to our lead underwriters, HEB, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, thank you for their support, as well as the Houston ISD Foundation. Imprint also received support from the Jerry C. Deering Family Foundation, Houston Endowment, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, and the Texas Commission on the Arts. Thanks to them, this series remains free open to the public, and we're able to give books by Renee out to all of you. We are also very grateful to Meyerland Mid Performing and Visual Arts Middle School. <clears throat> They've been hosting this series for many years, and especially we want to thank the principal, and of course our beloved librarian, Celeste Cooper, and everybody from Meyerland that's here today. Um, and let's also thank all of the teachers, librarians, school administrators, and parents who encouraged all of us to come here today. They make this series possible. So thank you, teachers, librarians, educators, parents. <laughs> and finally, we want to thank Imprint Board member and Houston author, Liara Tamani, who helped us originally connect to Renee. 
Thank you, Liara. We are grateful. Um, you know, I have to say, coming together to celebrate the power and joy of books and the authors who write them, ensuring kids have access to all the great books out there, and promoting books that help all kids see themselves in literature is why the Imprint Cruel Brain series exists. How perfect to have Renee Watson in the series to help us do just this. How many of you have read one of Renee's books? Good deal. Um, how many of you have read one of, the, one of her Ryan Hart books? All right. <laughs> okay, well, for those of you who don't know, Renee is a recipient of a Newbery Honor, Honor and a Coretta Scott King Award. Um, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, and she's written several picture books, middle grade books, and YA books. Um, one of her most famous books is Piercing Me Together. Um, and her other Ryan Hart books include Ways to Make Sunshine, Ways to Share Joy, Ways to Grow Love, and of course this latest, Ways to Build Dreams. Do any of you know how old Renee was when she first started writing? Any guesses? Take a guess, guys. Go ahead, what's your guess? 15, no, not far though. She was seven, can you believe that? <laughs> That's the age she was when one of her teachers predicted she would be a writer one day. And her teacher was right. So let's silence our cell phones and please no flash photos during the presentation. Help me give a warm and excited welcome to Renee Watson. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to be with you all today. I am loving my time in Houston. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I thought that I would begin by sharing who I am with you. So I write fiction, mostly. And so I thought I would share something that's true about me before we get into writing about and talking about the fiction. So I am of Jamaican descent. I was born in Patterson, New Jersey. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I currently live in New York City. I live in Harlem. So this poem that I'm going to read to you uh, honors all of those spaces and places and all the people who helped raise me. If you know your five senses, I want you to think about what you can smell, taste, touch, hear, all of those things vividly in this poem. I'm using sensory detail to describe where I'm from. I'm made up of East Coast hip hop and island tradition. I'm from Baptist hymns and secular jigs, tambourine playing, late night staying at the church house or my friend's house or their friend's house on the weekends. Where I'm from, there are corduroy hand-me-downs and family keepsakes, family pictures on the wall, open Bible on the coffee table. I'm from that side of town. Where the media only comes for blood shed, blood wasted, never for blood restored, celebrated or regenerated. I'm from hopscotch and double dutch, from hide and go seek and Pac-Man. I'm from curry goat, rice and peas and beef patties, from turquoise, blue water, white sand and dreadlocks. Reggae is in my blood. Grew up in the Pacific Northwest, a place where rain falls more than sun shines. I'm from Douglas firs and pine trees, where we walk under waterfalls, drive up windy roads, and escape to the beaches on the Oregon coast. Where I'm from, music takes away the blues. I'm from Bob Marley, Mahalia Jackson, Aretha Franklin, James Brown. I'm from Jackson 5 Records and New Edition Tapes. Where I'm from, we rewind tapes over and over and over again so you can write down the lyrics and memorize them. 
where I'm from, the whole neighborhood is your family. Ladies sit on their porches looking out for you, shooing away boys like flies, calling your mama to tell her what you did before you can get home and lie about it. Where I'm from, people ask my friend, is that your hair? And she says, yeah, it's mine, I bought it. I'm from divorce, being passed down to children like a family heirloom. From single mamas pushing strollers, praying that their babies don't have the same struggles as them, I'm from a little, goes a long way. From sun's gonna shine after the rain, I'm from persevering souls and hardworking hands from a people destined to make it to their promised land. I'm from been there, done that, can, and will do it again. Now you, tell me, where are you from? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to read um, a scene from Ways to Make Sunshine first. I thought we would start with the first book before we get to Ways to Build Dreams. Uh, the neighborhood that I described in that poem is the neighborhood where the character Ryan Hart lives. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon, a very uh, northeast Portland, and it was a very misunderstood area of Portland, the predominantly black neighborhood. And a lot of people thought that that side of town was the bad side of town and that nothing good could come from that area. And so in my writing, I like to celebrate all the beauty and resilience and joy and talent and brilliance that is in that community. And so the character, Ryan, is running around the park. And Alberta Park is a real park in Portland. She goes to Vernon Elementary School, which is a real school School, the school that I went to, I wanted to place her in real places around the city and especially in a neighborhood um, where there were perceptions and stereotypes about that neighborhood to show this character living and thriving and being her beautiful self. Uh, it is also my old and my love letter um, to Portland and to appreciate Beverly Cleary, who wrote the famous Ramona Quimby, who also is from Portland, Oregon. Uh, I was saying yesterday, I knew Clickitat Street. I know where that street is. It's a real street in Portland. I knew where the library was, where the school uh, that Ramona attended went to. And I loved reading a book where my neighborhood, my city was on the page. And so I'm also writing for brown and black girls in Portland so that they can see themselves literally on the page. So in this scene, Ryan is letting her competitiveness get the best of her. Uh, her name means king, and her parents have told her, we want you to be who we named you to be. We named you king, we named you Ryan, because we want you to be a leader. We want you to be kind, we want you to be thoughtful, um, but it's kind of hard to be thoughtful and kind all the time, right? Especially when a boy named Brandon is getting on your last nerves because he keeps teasing you. So he keeps teasing her about her name and the substitute teacher keeps treating her like she's a fragile thing, uh, all because she's a girl. So in this moment, Ryan is frustrated at Brandon and at the substitute teacher and she wants to prove to them that she can be and do anything. This is from Ways to Make Sunshine. When it's time to go outside for recess, Brandon, Marcus, and the boy with glasses, who I never talked to, are splashing around in puddles and stomping in mud. Then they race each other up the monkey bars. I walk over to join in on the climbing, but before I can get there, the substitute teacher says to me, why don't you go over there, sweetheart, and points to the swings and slide. I'd rather stay here, pretending to climb a mountain. So I say, no, thank you, and keep walking to the monkey bars. The substitute teacher follows me, and that's when I realize that it wasn't a suggestion or question. It was a demand. I really think it'd be safer if you stay off the monkey bars. Besides, you and Brandon might need a break from each other. I'll stay out of Brandon's way, I say. And I don't think it's dangerous. I play on them all the time. I bet I can climb faster than all those boys. Just then, Brandon shouts out, you can't beat me. And he jumps down, showing off. I bet you a pack of green apple Jolly Ranchers that you can't beat me. Let's race. Race? Yeah, last one to that pole has to buy the winter candy. He points to the tetherball pole across the playground. I think about it. There's a small crowd forming, and now I feel like I have to say yes. Like I have to prove to the substitute teacher that I can play whatever I want with whoever I want. 
I don't like Jolly Ranchers, I tell Brandon. When I win, you have to buy me a Twix. I look over at Kiki, one of my best friends. She smiles and gives us our countdown. On your mark, get set, go. I hear our friends all cheering, but mostly I hear the sound of my breath huffing and puffing in, out, in, out. My feet slap the pavement and I run as fast as I can. Brandon is beating me, but not by much. I move my arms through the air, forcing myself to go faster. I catch up and then, just like I knew I could, I start running faster than Brandon by a lot. I am winning. I am winning. The pole is close, and if I stretch my arm out far enough, I'll reach it. I run a few more steps, and when I go to put my right foot down, something happens. My right foot doesn't touch the pavement the way a running foot usually touches the pavement. Instead, it stumbles and hiccups its way to the cold ground. I have fallen. Blood is trickling out of my knee, and there's a stinging and pounding feeling all throughout my leg. Instead of stopping the race to see if I'm okay, Brandon runs right past me, tags the pole, and says, yes, beat you, you owe me a pack of Jolly Ranchers. No fair, Kiki yells. She was at the pole first. It's not her fault her shoe is untied. I didn't even realize that's what happened. My shoe is untied. I tripped over my shoelace. Don't be a sore loser, Brandon says. He's right, I tell Kiki. I never touched the pole. On our way home from school, I ask my brother, do you have two dollars? He answers, why? And this means he has two dollars. He's just not sure if he wants to give them to me. What happened to your jeans, Ray asks, looking at the hole. It's a long story, I tell him. I hold out my hand. I'll pay you back. He gives me two dollars, and when we get to the corner store, I go straight to the candy aisle, buy a pack of green apple Jolly Ranchers for Brandon, and a Twix for me. Okay, so that's a scene from Ways to Make Sunshine. And as you see, you know, Ryan is embarrassed and frustrated in this moment, but she's the kind of person, the kind of character, who is going to figure out how to make the best of a situation. So she's like, I'm not going to throw a tantrum. I'm not going to say we have to have a rematch. Fine, Brandon, you won on a technicality. I'm going to get you your candy. But I'm getting myself something, too, because I tried. And that's the kind of character that she is. So I love her, her attitude and her personality of, of trying trying, trying again, and of looking for the sun and looking for the good in any situation. So in, in ways to build dreams, Ryan is learning for the first time maybe that it's not just uh, what she can do well. It's not just about her talent that is important, but it's about who she is. And in this moment, for the first time, she's beginning to think about who does she want to be in the world? So they've just had breakfast for dinner. How many of you have ever had breakfast for dinner? Just raise your hand. Yeah. It was that kind of day in the family. Uh, and Ryan, who loves to cook and loves to make up recipes, is trying out some new things. So she's made ginger hot chocolate. And Ray is like, mm -mm, this is too spicy. I do not like it. So he just wants regular hot chocolate. But the dad seems to like it. And this is the conversation they have at the dinner table. Ray tells us about his next poetry slam. I made it to the finals, and if I win this, I get to compete in the citywide competition, he says. This time, the theme is dreams. We can write about real dreams we've had, but also what we hope for ourselves or for our world. What are you gonna write about, mom asks. Ray shrugs, I'm not sure yet. Dad pours more hot chocolate, and now I know he meant it when he said he liked it. Well, what are some of your dreams? What do you hope for your future? Ray says, I have a lot of dreams. Sometimes I want to be a professional baseball player, and sometimes I think maybe I'll be a music producer. Oh, and I could be a poet. You'd be good at all of those things, Ray, Dad says. And what kind of person do you want to be? What do you mean? Well, you're telling me what you want to do as in a career, and it's good to have dreams of what kind of job you want to have, but I also want you and Ryan to think of who you want to be, what kind of world you want to live in. That's one question no adult has ever asked me. Always they ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? But I have never been asked, who do you want to be? 
I've never thought about there being a difference. So from this moment on in the book, Ryan is trying to figure out who does she want to be? How is she going to show up in the world beyond her talents? Is she going to be kind? Is she going to be forgiving? Is she going to be generous? Um, she's working on those skills that sometimes we call soft skills, but those are the hard things to be. We can get better at writing or acting or singing or all the kind of career things, right? But to practice empathy and to practice love is a really hard thing, and that is what Ryan is working on in ways to build dreams. So I'm going to pause here and uh, open it up for questions. My favorite part of being an author is meeting the people who I'm writing for, and that is all of you, especially the young people in the room um, and the educators in the house. So I'm going to take questions. We'll talk for a little bit. I'll close with one last poem and with a call and response activity, and then I'll come meet you if you come up to the table to say hello. So who wants to break the ice? Does anyone have a question? And anyone can ask, young people, adults, anyone can ask. Yes. What books inspired me to start writing? So, like I mentioned, the Ramona series, I loved Beverly Cleary, Judy Bloom. I grew up on those books. But really, um, I think I found my voice and I found like the passion to write by reading poetry. So poetry is really my first love. And it's the first mirror I had where I read poems and I was like, these people sound like me. They sound like the folks at my church. They're talking about things that matter to me. And those poets were Nikki Giovanni, Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, and Lucille Clifton. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks, too. I grew up on those poets, and I always say they raised me. And so I first uh, started to love writing and love reading by reading their work. Yes. How did I make the character up? So she's loosely based on my real Ryan in my life. So I, my goddaughter, her name is Ryan. And Ro the real Ryan, when she was the character's age, she loved to cook and make up recipes. And I would go to her house, and she was always playing in her play kitchen and coming over to me, asking me to taste this, taste that. Um, and she's a really good big sister to her little sister and her little brother. So I based the character off of her. Um, and then I'm inspired by all the young people that I meet. So uh, when I go out and get to meet you all, I travel a lot and I get to collect stories and meet who you are and, and learn about what you care about. And that comes back with me. When I start writing, I'm thinking of you. I have you in mind when I'm writing. And then the last thing that inspires me is my childhood. So sometimes I'm pulling memories from when I was Ryan's age and I'm working that into the book as well. Thank you for your question. Yes, way in the back, I see you. Why do you write? Why do I write? I love this question. Um, I write because I believe words have power. And when I was your age, so she shared in the bio that when I was in the second grade, I wrote a 21-page story, and my teacher was like, wow, okay. And I always thank her because can you imagine the spelling and the handwriting of a second grader and 21 pages of that? So God bless you educators and parents who are listening to all the stories. Uh, my mother would listen to everything that I wrote while she was cooking. I would be sitting on the kitchen floor reading to her out of my journal, and she listened to everything. So I've always been a writer, but at that same time in my life, my family didn't have a lot of money. I always say we were economically poor, but we were rich and wealthy in so many other ways. We had a lot of love, a lot of resilience, a lot of faith, um, a lot of fun, right? Um, and so for birthdays of friends or, or elders at my church, extended family members, I could not afford to buy anything for their birthdays or for the holidays. So I would write a poem and I would give poems as gifts, and I'd be really embarrassed about that. So I'd give the gift, but then I'd run away. I would not stand there for you to open it. But so many times, people would come back to me later and say, oh, Renee, that poem you wrote me, I'm, it made me cry, or I'm going to keep it forever. I'm framing it. And I was just amazed that my words can move someone to tears, that my words can make them want to keep it. And I learned that I have power in my tongue and that I might not have a lot of money, but that I had um, 
I had something special and I've always wanted to use it from that moment on. I was like, oh, writing is amazing because I can make you scared. I can make you happy. I can make you fearful by putting words together. And I thought that was pretty cool. So all of those reasons um, come together to why I write. Yes, here and then I see you. So Kiki and Amanda, I, you know, I grew up with a whole community of amazing friends. So I just, I love writing about friendship. I think um, friendships between girls are super important. And I don't think you need a whole lot of friends, but you need one or two people who you know, they got your back and you're going to have theirs and you're going to grow together. And so I just wanted Ryan to have somebody that she can have fun with, but who can also push her. You know, Kiki is a little more... Um, outward and she's not as shy as Ryan. So I think Ryan is learning a little bit from Kiki on how to be confident and how to share her, her talent. So yes, I wanted her to have a good friend because I've had so many in my life. Yes. Who gave you the confidence to start writing? Who gave me the confidence to start writing? I think it was probably my mother and maybe some of my teachers. Um, I've always had people who said, you know, you're really good at this. You should keep going. You should keep going. Uh, or, or they would encourage my mom to buy me journals. And I, I have had so many journals over the years of all these poems and stories. But I never shared my stories. Like, I would read them to my mother. I would turn them into my teacher. But if you asked me to get up in class and read it, mm -mm, I was not trying to do that. So it took me a long time to have the confidence to stand in front of people and really share my voice. I would read other people's poems I could perform a Maya Angelou poem, but I was not going to share what I wrote. Uh, that took a lot of time. And I, I think it was probably educators who were very patient with me, but kept nudging me to, to get up and to do. One day in class, I had to, it was a part of the grade, and I cared about my grades. My mama cared about my grades. So I knew that I needed to pass this final exam. Part of the exam was written. The other part was getting up and speaking in front of the class. And I held my paper like this. And I read in a really quiet voice. And, and slowly as I looked, I could see my peers were really listening. So I pulled my paper down and I got louder and louder. And I think that is when I realized, oh, OK, it's OK. It's OK. It's OK to be nervous, right? Um, but do the thing that makes you scared anyway. That's the only way you become brave, right? So being scared or nervous, that is totally fine. It usually means you care about what you're about to do. Uh, so I feel that fear, and then I do it anyway. Yes, in the back. Yes, you. How long did it take me to make this book? You know... I, I'll say this all the time, I don't count because I think if I tracked how long it took, I would be very discouraged and I don't know that I would keep writing. It takes a long time to make a book. Um, the first part is getting the, the story out, right? So I write the story um, and that can take anywhere from sometimes a month to three months or six months to just write the first draft. And then even when my publisher says, we love it and we wanna publish it and they pay me, they still say, and now here is a letter with some um, changes we would like you to make. So then I got to go back to the drawing board. So what publishing looks like is I write the first draft. I give it to my editor. She makes uh, suggestions, comments. I work on it some more. I give it back. She may make some more. We do these exchanges several times before it gets just right. So some books I've done that exchange five times. Sometimes I've done that exchange, like for picture books, I've done it like 15 times because actually picture books are the hardest ones to write because it's the least amount of words to tell the biggest story. So the real writing happens in revision. It takes a while to make a book, but if that's what you love and that's what you want to do, it is possible to do hard things. So yes, writing is hard, but it's also really fun. And I love looking at where it started and then where it ended up. Sometimes my characters surprise me. Yes. Ooh, why did I do a chapter book instead of a graphic novel? So I write in multiple um, genres. I have picture books, I have young adult novels, I write poems, 
I might do a graphic novel one day. Who's to say? Like, I, I don't say um, that I only do middle grade or I only do chapter books. I am a writer, so I like to create all kinds of stories, even plays and things that won't be in a, a book. I like or maybe a movie one day, right? So maybe there will be a graphic novel for me. I'm not sure, but that's not something that I've said I won't do. Yes. You right here. Mm-hmm. Recommendations for people who are trying to figure out who they want to be in the world. My recommendation is to learn yourself. Because there's going to be a lot of people who come and try to change you and tell you what to believe, um, tell you who to love, tell all the things, right? So the more you know yourself, the least likely you can be moved. You got to anchor yourself in who you really are and hold on to that person. And the people who help you anchor yourselves, hopefully you have some folks in your family or at your school or in the community who you know that you can tell them anything and they're going to help you remind you who you are and what you value and what you care about. So that when you start to sway, they're like, no, 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 no. Remember, you said you want to go to college. You can't be doing this if you want to go. You know, they're going to remind you of the things that you promised to yourself. So get to know who you are. Figure out what do you like to do? What do you actually care about? Not what people want you to care about, but what, do, what makes your heart sing? And then when you figure what that is, hold on to that and move towards that as fast as you can, as much as you can. And whenever someone comes and tries to detour you, you go to those people who are your anchors and you ask them to, I need you to help hold me down because it's getting rocky out here. I'm being moved all the way around, but I want to stay focused. That's one thing I would say. Um, and the other thing I want you to do is to learn how to forgive yourself. You're going to make a bunch of mistakes. That's okay. That's what living is. That's, that's what it is. We, and adults, make them too. We don't like to tell young people, but we do. Uh, so I'm saying this to everyone in the room. Be patient with yourself. Forgive yourself and grow. Move on from the thing that you're embarrassed about or ashamed of. Own it. And then do better. Just do better the next time. Keep letting yourself do and be better, and you'll be all right. Yes, in the red. <laughs> <laughs> so the first illustrator was Nina Mata um, for all of the books until we got to Ways to Share Joy. And then Andrew did the interiors and Nina is still, she still did the cover. Um, I love the process of figuring out who's going to illustrate and what they're going to illustrate. Um, and Nina Mata was a gift to this project. I have loved collaborating with her and working with her and seeing her bring Ryan to life. So most of the time, we were just talking about this a moment ago, most of the time um, I get to see maybe a portfolio or some samples of artwork and I can kind of choose my top three. And then there's a whole art team that's also making decisions because they know the market and they know what works best for this age group. So we kind of come together, have a meeting of the minds and decide who would be the best for this project. Before I move on, I just want you can put your hands. I'm going to talk for a little bit. How many artists are in the room, visual artists? I know we have writers here, but yes, there's some visual artists. Okay, you can put your hands down. How many of you are good at decorating your room? Like you are just good at putting stuff together and you like to do that kind of stuff. Okay, you can put your hand down. How many of you are good at putting outfits together? You're like, this, that don't match, but this looks good together and this will go cute. Yeah, okay, you can put your hands down. If you raised your hand for any of that, you might be good at book design. Sometimes we only talk about the author or the illustrator, and those are amazing and important jobs too. But in publishing, someone decided what that font is going to look like. Someone chose what the colors were going to be in the title. Someone is choosing where my name goes and what the font is of that and what the back cover is going to look like. So if you're good at putting things together, you have a good eye, you know what works well together. Maybe you don't want to be a writer, but there's so many careers in publishing. And if you like to, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for this one, but if you like to tell people what to do, <laughs> 
if you always have an opinion about something or if you watch a movie and you're like, man, that movie was so good to the very end, you might be a good editor because editors, they're not writing the stories, but they have strong opinions about how these stories should be. And if you're that person, you might be really good. If you love to read, but you don't want to write, you could be the person that helps the writer get their story to be just right so that the ending is amazing and that all the story flows together. So there are many careers in publishing besides author, illustrator. I just wanted to make sure I said that too. All right, we're back to questions, yes. I just wanted you to give us a little insight on how you felt when you found out that your books would be mass produced or be in bookstores. Oh goodness, uh, I was happy and in disbelief and excited. I think I remember um, the, when, I, when I knew that I had a meeting with my first editor for my very first picture book, I was leaving school, I was in college and I was walking in New York City to the subway to go back to the dorm. And I called one of my sisters, her name is Diane. And I said, I think my life is about to change. She was like, what happened? What's going on? I was like, well, and I tell her the whole story of what had just happened. And I was having a meeting that week with an editor. Um, so yeah, I feel very blessed and it means a lot to me to get to do this. I feel like I am, it, it, it means a lot because you all are trusting me, especially the adults in the room. You are trusting me with the young people who you care about. To have someone read a book, that takes time. I'm, you're spending an hour or more with me in this story, and you've trusted me to come into your home, to come into your classroom, and spend time with your young person. That is not lost on me, I don't take it lightly. So it feels really special that I get to do this, and then I get to do it again and again and again, and all over the world now, it feels really special. Yes, in the blue in the back, I see you. Can, can you say it one more time a lot louder? What time and or age did I start getting interested in writing? So I was always interested in writing. I was the girl who everyone else is running around the playground and I'm sitting under a tree with my notebook. So I just loved to tell stories, even when I was young. I think when I realized I can... I really want to do this was probably middle school, high school. My, I wrote a play and the, the theater teacher chose my play to be the spring production for the school. They literally put it on for the whole school. And that is when I realized, oh, like I, I can write outside of just this journal. This might be something to share with other people. Um, and so I've been wanting to pursue writing for most of my life, really. I did not know that I could be a writer for a career. I just knew I would always write like on the side as a hobby, as a thing I would do. I didn't know I could pursue it until college, really, is when I thought, oh, I can actually make a living as a writer. Anybody else? Yes. How many books have I written? I, it's 20 something, I don't know the exact number, but it is, I'm at 20, I think five. Um, and that's, again, picture books, middle grade, young adult, and an adult novel next year. So I have a lot of books in the world. I saw a hand, yes. What made you start writing poetry? Mm, what made me start writing poetry? I think I, I poetry, you can break rules, <laughs> right? You. Um, when you're young, you don't have a lot of power. You can't vote. You have rules at home. You have rules at school. Every, people are always telling you what to do. And so as a young person trying to find my voice and feeling all this um, frustration sometimes and sadness from what was happening in my world, I think poetry was the outlet for me to express it, to get it out. I didn't know this at the time. I, wouldn't, I wasn't saying to myself at 10 or at 12, I need to process what's happening in my life. But when I look back on those years, that is exactly what I was doing. Um, and you can verb a noun, you can break a line, you don't have to write in full sentences. You can experiment and play with language and I needed to be able to do that because there were so many other things always telling me what to do, who to be, or what I should show up as. So I think poetry is where I am most free. I, I express myself the most free when I'm writing, and especially when I'm writing poetry. 
Yes. Behind, yeah, you with the braid. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Oh, at the end. You know, I, well, I needed some more plot for the next book. She was asking, why did I make Ryan the middle child? And at the end, you know, the big surprise that the mom reveals. Um, you, I don't know, really. I really did not think that we were going to have Rose until I was writing it. And that is just what happened. I wanted to play around with the... You know, in the beginning, she gets ice cream, and it's the, some good news, but not good news. And I wanted to keep playing around with these parents giving her ice cream, but telling her not so good news. <laughs> and they, so I just was like, what else could the news be? And then I thought of that. And I wanted her to have a sister because Ray was always getting his way with the paper, rock, scissors, and all of that. So I needed her to have a, a little teammate in the family. And you know, the interesting thing is the real Ryan in my life, so she had an older brother, and at the time, she also already had her, her younger sister. But after I wrote that book, they got a new blessing in the family, and her parents now have a little, a little, little one. Um, it's a boy. His name is Malachi. So we were so tickled that I wrote into their lives that they were having another baby. Uh, and he is all, all joyful. I love him so much. Uh, yes. <laughs> Say it, what, wait, I'm sorry, two people start. I'm gonna go here and then I'll come to you, okay? You first. Have I ever been frustrated with one of my books? I have been frustrated with all of my books. <laughs> uh, every book, so this is the thing about writing. Every book is different. So in one way, yes, I know how to write a book but I don't know how to write the book that I'm working on, right? I don't know these characters. I don't know what should happen. It's a whole different plot, sometimes a whole different um, city or a different year, a time frame that I'm writing in, a different set of circumstances. So yeah, it gets hard. Every book that I've ever written, there is a point that I get to that I'm like, oh, I can't do, I don't know what to do with this story. And that's when I give it to a friend or my editor or, you know, and I just, can you help me? <laughs> give me some feedback. Here are some things I, I don't know what to do with and we talk it through. So yes, um, that is what is so important about the revision process. You can write the whole story. It can be so messy, but you can't fix anything that's not already on the page, right? So you just got to finish the first draft and let it be messy and then go back and fix it. Yeah, and I will say this, sometimes it's not that I'm stuck. I get frustrated too at my characters. Sometimes they're not doing what I want them to do. And I'm trying to write this plot in and it just is not working. And then I have to kind of fall back and listen to what the story wants to do. Sometimes stories take shape and they, they, they have a life of their own even though I'm the one making it, which could sound weird. But an example of that is in Ways to Make Sunshine, Ryan, uh, plays a prank on her brother. She puts very spicy, this is a spoiler alert, so, but we're on the fourth book, so y'all already know ways to make sunshine. She uh, makes something super, super spicy, and he cannot handle su spice, so it's a big deal, and the parents are so upset with her, and they send her to her room, and Renee, the writer, this is a moment where I can maybe teach young people a lesson, or I could go fall back on who I would have been as a kid, which would be terrified if my mom was that mad at me, and I would, you know. So Ryan goes to her room, and I think she's going to go in there and be sad, and maybe write a, a apology to Ray or something. This little girl goes into her room and when I was writing the scene, she sits down and I was like, okay, what is she going to say? What is she? And she's like, yes, I can't wait till the next prank. And she's thinking up other things and she's like, I got him. And I was like, Ryan. And I was like, am I going to leave this in here? And like, yes, because that's who she is, right? So sometimes um, it's not that I'm stuck. It's just the character surprises me and is doing what they want to do. And I have to let that also happen. Uh, even the mean girl red, she got on my nerves a lot, but I had to let her be who she was. There was someone here, and then I think I saw someone. Okay, yes. Ooh, how did I come up with the titles? <laughs> 
Titles are the hardest part for me. I just looked over at my editor because we have massive brainstorming sessions and make lists and try to find the best one. At least with this one, I had a formula to follow. Ways to Make Sunshine is a title of one of the chapters in the book. And it was actually Sarah who picked that one out and said, maybe this is, we're on to something. This feels like... Um, the heart of the story, the heart of Ryan's personality. It's a rainy, gloomy day. She was planning to be outside with her friends, and she has to stay inside. So she literally makes sunshines, she cuts them out, hangs them in the room, uh, turns on all the lights, brings in lamps to make it even more bright. Like, she is the sunshine queen. And that's when we realize, I think, oh, that is what this you know, story and the series is about. So at least I had ways to, and then do something. And so that was the pattern to follow for these books. But titles are the hardest part for me. Um, but that's how we came up with it. It was based on one of the chapters in the book. I can take a few more and then I'm going to close out. We'll go here and then here. It's okay. Are you the type of writer who has to write in isolation? Like you go and get a hotel room and cut everybody off for 30 days? Or do you write around your everyday life? I, I tend to write around my everyday life, um, but there are moments where I, am, I can take a week or a weekend and kind of go on a retreat, even if it's a self-made retreat. So sometimes a, a group of friends will just go, and we're, we know we're going to be writing, so we get up early, we have breakfast, and we chit-chat at breakfast, but then when we say it's writing time, we go write. And then in the evenings, we have dinner and catch up and talk. So I've done that before. Um, but it's very rare that I can take 30 days, I wish. I have never been able to take that long and just go right. Um, but I do, I'm, I'm really good at making time, especially when I was working full time. I would write on lunch breaks. I would write, I, I would not go straight home after work. I would go to a coffee shop first, because if I go home after a day of work, it's a wrap. I'm not doing nothing, I'm gonna watch Scandal. This was back, you know, 2012 days. I would go home and want to watch TV. Uh, so I would figure it out. And now I'm a full time writer, so I kind of have a schedule uh, where I can write every day, but mostly I'm figuring it out around my life. Okay, uh, last two questions. Yes. Uh, I remember the author from uh, Eat, Pray, Love saying that she always had fear that there would not be anything left in the tank. Mm. You know, that she would have exhausted all of her creative energy and depending on the views. What you said about Ryan coming to you and being like, no, I'm not going to go to that room and write on the quality letter. And she was like, no, I'm actually going to go and celebrate think of the next thing. It made me think of that. But what's your fear? You know, do you, do you ever have a fear as a writer that there won't be anything left, that you will have exhausted all of your creativity? What is, is, so that's the first question, yes or no. And then what are some of your fears and how do you get over them as a writer? I don't fear lack of creativity or having ideas. I feel like as long as I'm engaging with the world and as long as this world keeps spinning, I will always have ideas. My books are in conversation with what's happening. There's always something happening. There's always something to mourn. There's always something to celebrate. There's always something to rage against. And so that is what my books do. So I think I'll always have ideas. I do fear or, or I think a lot about making sure I'm relevant making sure that I don't, um, I always want black girls to be at the center of my work. And I want to make sure that no matter how well the books do or how well my career goes, that that is the thing that I come back to is the folks that I'm writing for and the, and the first readers. You know, I'm writing for everyone. Everyone's welcome to the table. I think about it as my mother would cook dinner for her children, right? But if I have friends over, they could show enough eat. Like, come on and eat at this table. So it's for my community. And I never want to let go of that. And I, I think about that often. Um, so that's, that's kind of the thing. If I'm worried about anything, it would be just making sure that I stay anchored in what, is, what matters to me, and that's my people. Um, fear, you know, there's, there's always something <laughs> to make you want to silence yourself. So we're living in days now where books are being banned, and there's all kinds of things that could come and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't write about that topic because that's the controversy right now. Um, but I just... I come from a mighty people. I can't let them down. 
they paid such a heavy price, right? So I, I, and they face way worse than I'm facing. So somebody tweeting about me, then they don't like my book. It's, the, it's nothing to pay for what my ancestors sacrificed. So I also think when those fears, and they're very real, when they come, I just try to rest in who I know I am and whose I know I am, if that makes sense. All right, our last question. Oh, thank you. It's similar to that, or you know, we hear all the time about how difficult it is in the writing and publishing business and, and the rejection that authors get. And a, a lot of it, how do you, or what would you say to young writers in this room in terms of how you encourage yourself, you know, after getting that letter, getting that, you know, you've reached this, how did you reach back and encourage yourself? And I know you spoke a little bit now about ancestors, but. That day-to-day, -day, you know, what, what do you say to yourself to Yeah, so I think it's important to know the difference between, like, what, you're, what you can control and what you can't control. So I have goals that I'm working towards. I can kind of control the outcome of those goals. Um, but the big, like, wish list type of dreams, awards, bestseller list, movie deals, all that, there's, you really cannot control it. You can want it, but that cannot be the motivation. Or if it is, it's gonna be a really hard career, right? So the things that I actually care about and I'm working towards, I, I think I, in the early years, before any of those types of things were happening for me, I was able to be fully satisfied because I really genuinely was writing for people. I loved author visits. I loved doing teacher workshops. You know what I mean? So that was... That was filling me, that was amazing. And anything else was icing on a really good cake. So I tell young people, um, you don't wanna just be famous. You don't wanna just be popular. You don't want just the award. I'm not saying you don't want them, but it cannot be the only thing. It cannot be the thing that drives you. You have to find your why are you doing this and, and focus on that. And that always would bring me back to myself when I was looking at what everybody else was getting or feeling like let down that my, I wasn't on a tour and everyone else gets to, you know. There are those moments where you're like, oh, I don't, it's not that I don't want it for that author, but I just want it too. And that's a very real feeling to have. So um, yeah, I think I would just try to bring myself back to what I said I was doing this for and, then, and that helped me. Um, and then just get better when nobody's watching and it's quiet in your life, this is the time to practice. This is the time to be ready. When I got my first book deal, and they asked me, what, do you, what else do you have? I was like, oh, I got something for you. And I had about five manuscripts that I could give them and say, what about this, what about this? Because I had been writing and writing and writing when nobody was paying attention to me. So that is the thing right now, at your age, young people, just create. Don't worry about what's gonna happen to the art with the art right now. Find your artistic voice, practice, 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 hone your craft, and when the opportunity comes, that is when things can fit together and take you places you didn't even know you could go. Okay, so I've talked a lot. I wanna have y'all talk. Um, we've talked a lot about dreams, and, and I, I speak a lot about changing the world, and I think, and Ryan says this, um, at a point in the book that it's important to think about changing the world, but the world is so big, it's so vast. What do we mean when we say, go change the world, be good citizens of the world? I think what we really mean is change your world, your community, your family, your neighborhood. What can you do to show kindness? What can you do to own up to your mistake and actually apologize? Are we being forgiving? Are we showing empathy? Are we standing up for folks who are new to the class or who are shy or who are being bullied? How are we bringing change in small everyday ways? Ryan is not uh, the loudest person in the room. Her brother is outwardly talented and he gets a lot of attention, um, but she's quiet. And I wanna talk to the quiet people. You can still be a leader. You can still be an activist. You can still change the world even in your quietness. Uh, you don't have to change your personality to make a difference. And to the loud folks, you know, share the space with some of the quieter voices uh, and give them, give them space to be who they are and not ask them to be loud with you, but just to be who they are. So we're gonna do an activity real quick, call and response. We're gonna say things at different levels just to kind of show and be our, a metaphor in our bodies 
that we can make change in everyday common ways. We can make change in big, loud ways. And we can be really quiet and bring change into the world, okay? So you're going to repeat after me. You're going to say what I say, how I say it, okay? I have a voice. My voice is powerful. My voice can change the world. I have a voice. My voice is powerful. My voice can change the world. I have a voice. My voice is powerful. My voice can change the world. All right, go change the world, Houston. I love you. It's good to be here today. Thank you for having me.